All right. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, launch uh, today's uh, Dean's Lecture. My name is Sten Vermund. I'm a Dean here at the Yale School of Public Health. And we are really pleased to have one of our own alumna uh, join us today. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Katz is a 1998 graduate of our MPH program at Yale. She holds her PhD from Princeton, and she probably doesn't even know that, but she and I share a common mentor. So when I was um, at Columbia, uh, a number of years before that, Bert Singer was one of my mentors. So there you go, a small world syndrome. Uh, at uh, Georgetown, uh, Professor Katz teaches courses on global health diplomacy, global health security, and emerging infectious diseases. And she's based in the School of Foreign Service. So she's very much preparing our diplomat, future diplomats uh, and policy experts in the uh, health uh, arena. Prior to joining Georgetown in 2016, she was 10 years at, G at GW, George Washington University, uh, at uh, what is uh, called the Milken Institute of Public Health, um, uh, which has uh, been an important part of GW um, uh, and its School of Public Health uh, uh, rising in, 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 in influence uh, in, in the US uh, public academic public health arena. From 2004 to uh, 2019, she served as a consultant to the Department of State and worked on issues related to the Biological Weapons Convention, uh, pandemic influenza and preparedness, and disease surveillance. So I think she may have been the least surprised person when COVID hit because she has been working on pandemic respiratory disease threats for quite a while. In early um, November, 2020, she was selected to be an advisor for the Biden administration's COVID task force, which has now morphed to be on the, um, on the White House task force with our own uh, 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 Marcella Nunes-Smith. Um, so today she will talk to us about pandemic planning, lessons learned from 25 years of preparedness planning, and uh, uh, really focused on pre-COVID and what we were doing to think about uh, all of the challenges for pandemic flu, uh, what immediate lessons can be learned from the pandemic, challenges in sufficient capacity building, and the role of academia. And uh, after her talk, we'll have uh, a moderated discussion and Albert Coe will come on to facilitate that conversation and we'll wrap up by one o'clock Eastern time. So thank you, Professor Katz, and we welcome you to take the, uh, the stage here. Thank you so much. Um, let me make sure I can share my screen here. Um, can everyone? Yes, we see Perfect. it. Beautiful. Excellent. Um, so I, I am, I'm really, really delighted to speak with all of you today. And um, I, for, for the, I'm thankful for the kind invitation and for your interest. Um, I can't see anybody who's, who's here, um, but I, I did want to say that I noted that on the participant list, there, there are some old friends, particularly from my MPH class of 98, as well as, as, as some newer colleagues. So thank you all for, for, for joining today. Um, and I also wanna thank Sten and, and really the entire Yale community who have been so vital to the COVID response and, and so thankful for the contribution of, of this public health community um, to, to, to the health of our public. So um, I just thank you for that. What I wanna do today is is quickly talk because I'm, I'm much more interested in the Q&A session um, on, on some of the lessons from the last 25 years um, and then tell you a little bit about what our academic center has been doing um, to try to support the, the pandemic preparedness and, and response. Um, I do have to, I have to start with a, oops, excuse me here. Let me see if this works. There we go. I have to start with a disclaimer. Um, and and I, I'm new on doing this. So I am honored to currently serve as a senior advisor at the Department of State uh, working on the COVID-19 global response and global health security in general. But I'm speaking here today in my academic capacity as a professor at Georgetown, 
But I have to say, for the record, the views I'm presenting today are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of the Department of State or the United States government. Okay, that being said, let me do 25 years of history really quickly. So if you'll indulge me, I'd like to start this talk by taking us back to 1996 and maybe a little, even a little bit before that. So if we're back in, our heads are in the early 90s, in the United States alone, the death rate from infectious diseases, excluding HIV AIDS, had risen by 22% between 1980 and 1992. HIV was spreading around the world. You had the rise of hemorrhagic fevers, the emergence of Ebola, Marburg, Lhasa. Um, and in 1992, then called IOM under Josh Lederberg, Robert Shope of Yale at the time, and Stanley Oaks published a study on emerging in infections, um, microbial threats to health in the United States. Now, I often go back to this landmark study and, and cite it when I teach all the factors that influence the emergence of, of infectious diseases, and also the 2004 follow-up study that expanded on those factors. But I'd also like to point out that this team of, as you can see the names here, some, some legends in the field, um, also had laid down a plan in this document on how to address both the recognition of and interventions against emerging infectious diseases. This document has detailed strategies for enhancing disease surveillance domestically and around the world, including how to track drug resistance, integrated data architecture, linking public health surveillance, MCM availability, laboratory data, clinical public health workforce issues. It talks about creating an effective global surveillance network for EIDs, including detection, lab capacity, information and response mechanisms. It talked about strengthening the US Public Health Service and expanding basic scientific research into the emergence of infectious diseases, looking at vaccines, antimicrobials, improved diagnostic tests, laboratories, the FETP program, drug and vaccine development creation, um, uh, uh, having a stockpile, vector control, public health education, and behavior change. So in 1992, and if all of this sounds familiar, it should. And I, I have to say, it, I, I, it makes me even frustrated to talk about it the, and, and going back and reading this because we haven't progressed all that much. But following this report, you had the 1994 outbreak of, of plague in India um, and the, the panic that led to the biggest post-independence migration of people in India with around 300,000 people leaving Surat city in two days out of fear of illness or being quarantined. In May of 1995, the World Health Assembly adopts the resolution to revise the international health regulations as they determined that the existing international health regulations were inadequate as a framework to address the growing threat of emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. Um, and as you all know, though, it would take about a decade for the revised international health regulations to be adopted. In June of 1996, the Clinton administration released NSTC-7, the idea to establish a national policy to address the threat of emerging infectious diseases through improved domestic and international surveillance, prevention, and response measures. This document identified contributing factors in 1996, such as climate change, ecosystem disturbances, increased movement and the deterioration of public health infrastructures as showing no sign of abatement. It identified the fact that a disease that emerges in one part of the world could be anywhere else within 24 to 36 hours, um, a notion that would uh, re be repeated often over the next 20, 25 years. It also included a diplomatic outreach strategy to encourage other nations and international organizations to assign higher priority to emerging infectious diseases. Of, of particular interest to me, it directed the Department of State to raise the issue of emerging infectious diseases in bilateral, regional, and multilateral discussions, and to negotiate cooperative agreements with other nations to promote the establishment of global surveillance and response networks. And it called on the US to support the World Health Organization and to urge WHO to develop regional inventories of resources. A couple months later, in August of 1996, I, I arrived at Yale to start my MPH program. 
I was coming off working in maternal and child health clinics in Southern India, where I had um, picked up an, an infectious disease and, and would spend the next two years studying public health and learning to think about uh, at the population scale at the same time that I was myself a patient. So I, including the times where I would, I would go and I would go to the health center and get my IV antibiotics first thing in the morning and then come and sit in the back of the lecture hall so I could run out when I got sick. And I mention this because I became the example of a person who could pick up a, a somewhat rare zoonotic disease and 36 hours later be walking through customs at, at JFK. So we fast forward to 2001 and you had the massive amount of resources that were put into biopreparedness following the anthrax letters to 2010 when then Secretary Clinton spoke about the importance of investing in global health security or to 2011 when President Obama spoke at the UN General Assembly about the need to come together to prevent, detect, and fight biological threats. So this fall, we, um, with support from Schmidt Futures, we put together an online library called Health Security Net. And the idea of this was to capture 25 years of pandemic warnings. It's a searchable database. It has about 1,300 pandemic-related documents between 1995 and 2019, we, we cut off the, uh, in 2020. And the purpose was to collate all of these pre-existing warnings, evaluations, oversight efforts, strategies, technical guidance, and other documents that would help us identify the ways in which decision makers had been previously informed about pandemic threats and risks. This historical collection of reports, testimonies, expert advice at the national and international level, I hope is now a critical resource to scholars who are studying what might have been known, unknown, acted upon, not acted upon in the years before COVID. Now, most of the records that we curated relate predominantly to medical preparedness and response. This, is, this classification reflects records in areas like medical countermeasures, non-pharmaceutical interventions, uh, medical training and workforce, state or local infectious disease preparedness, hospital preparedness, clinical response, and, and other related items. You can also see here that um, there was always a lot of attention, both domestically and around the world, immediately in the wake of an outbreak but then that attention wanes over time. So throughout these 25-ish years, there has in fact been a, a committed group of professionals, policymakers, academics, civil society, who've been working um, on these issues of pandemic preparedness, often without much recognition. But in 2009, um, uh, we convened the first international scientific conference on global health security. And you'll see, um, I, I co-convened this along with my colleague, Adam Camrat scott the, at um, University of Sydney. And one of the things we did for this conference that, that brought together about a thousand people from around the world was that we crowdsourced what we call the Sydney Statement on Global Health Security. And the idea was to set forth a set of, of core principles. Um, now, these core principles on health security would include um, that interventions had to be inclusive, equitable, data-driven, that all countries needed minimum disease prevention, detection, and response capabilities, and achieving global health security is intricately linked to universal health coverage and system strengthening that governments must comply with the international health regulations and other legal and regulatory agreements, that achieving global health security requires all sectors of society, including the private and philanthropic sectors, that global health security must embrace a One Health approach, that countries with capacity have a moral and ethical duty to work with less resourced countries to strengthen capabilities in a sustainable manner. And that doing all of this requires sustainable, comprehensive funding mechanisms. Yet, despite all of this, we continue to face major challenges. 
And I, this is a slide I put together for a talk I gave in October 2019, so pre-COVID, on the, on the challenges in global health security. But I, I think that all of these challenges still remain and, and are now only amplified. We still have the challenge of prioritization, of capacity building, of leadership, um, and, and certainly in, in funding and, and also in MCM development. Um, and they remain the areas we need to focus on. But I, I have to say, I think the, the biggest failure of, of our community might have been the failure of imagination. We all intellectually knew that a pandemic was a possibility. We also knew exactly where the fault lines were. We knew which parts of the international health regulations would fail. We knew there would be supply chain challenges. We knew it would be difficult to take early actions without full information, as we know for all emerging infectious diseases. We didn't predict the impact, the significant impact of leadership or, or lack thereof. And we didn't think, honestly, that anybody would listen if we put forward the ask at the scale that we knew would be required to be prepared. So maybe the important lesson is that, that we need to yell louder and, and make sure that we are, are collectively heard when we talk about the importance of, of preparedness. So let me, uh, give me a few minutes here. Let me, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what, the, what our center has been doing. Um, the Center for Global Science and Security at Georgetown has been doing to support pandemic preparedness. Um, I should note, you know, we are a, we're a multidisciplinary center. We're relatively small. We've got about six faculty, seven staff, and at the moment, almost 40 students. Um, but we, we've been committed to trying to build, build the evidence base for action. We've been working on thinking with, with decision makers, including at the municipal level. We spent a lot of time looking at global norms and global governance of disease, and also trying to figure out like where the next where the next threat is. So how do we map climate and conflict to disease? Now, some of the work that we've been involved in, um, it, it's, been, it's been a busy year as it has for everybody. I, one of the first things we became engaged with was, was with the COVID Act Now team. Um, some of you may, this is a, clearly a map from much earlier in the pandemic. Um, and um, they were, they're a, a group of, of mostly tech experts um, who had come together and, and, and were trying to use their expertise to communicate what was happening with the pandemic to the public. Um, we, we took a look early on at their back end and, and got really confused by how they were building their, their models. So, so we came in and rebuilt their epidemiologic models for them. Um, so that was kind of the beginning of our engagement. We then also started getting uh, creating what we call COVID AMP, um, which is, uh, stands for Analysis and Mapping a Policy. Um, we, we needed to know what policies were implemented when and where to know it works. So at this point, this is actually an old slide. We've now curated over 30,000 policies with about 65 metadata per policy to capture relevant information for our quantitative qualitative analysis. I'm leaving that slide, but that's okay. Um, but but, but it's, it's kind of a cool tool. It allows you to either quickly visualize what policies are in place um, and we've also been tracking um, on the legal and regulatory side, some of the court challenges that are happening. We've actually just taken that down from the site so we can do some QAQC on it before we re-up re it. And, and now we're starting to get to the point of, of looking at what, what can we do with this and how do we analyze this? Um, one of the kind of neat things that we've been able to do is um, bring together different disciplines. And our, our students who've been working on the COVID AMP project are teamed up with student graduate students from the Latin American Studies program in our School of Foreign Service. And together, they put together a series of issue briefs on COVID in, in the Americas. And they're actually presenting that on Friday. Um, so we have COVID AMP. We, for years, um, I, think, I think the first time I published on this was in 2011, looking at what we were calling urban, urban governance of disease. Um, we, we knew that in a, in a major health crisis, 
it was going to be the municipal level leaders who were going to be responsible for quarantine, for knowing where the vulnerable populations were, for all of these things. So um, several years ago, we, we became involved with um, one of the networks of mayors. It's called the Global Parliament of Mayors. And, um, and we were working with them to basically on, on preparedness, on recognition and also preparedness and released um, something called the Rapid Urban Health Security Assessment Tool. It's something we've been working on for a couple of years with the mayors and then rushed to get out the door after the pandemic hit. Um, based on that work with, with municipal level leaders, we then teamed with um, some colleagues from the Center for Global Development and NTI and Tal's analytics and created what we call the frontline guide for local decision makers. Um, so something to help help mayors around the world think about what 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 information do they need in order to and how to act next. And we did this for um, with a with an eye towards mostly domestic um, local level leaders. And then we created another version for low resource environments. And then. Uh, to build on that, we then created a, a set of metrics for opening and reopening. Um, and what was really neat about this was that we, we put forward a series of metrics at the same time that other academic colleagues were doing this and, and other, other members of civil society. And um, in, I think, an act, uh, in, in, in a, I think something that really told you about the importance of people coming together. Um, we all, we all then came together for convergence um, to, so that the public wouldn't be confused. So we could all be speaking the same story on around metrics. Um, and in some places we didn't agree, but that was okay. We could actually have a narrative to say, um, you know, this group at Harvard thinks this and this group over here thinks that, and this is why they're different. And we all have the same story for it. So this, this was published on covidlocal.org. Um, we had then been working for a couple of years on something we call GOAL, the Georgetown Opera Activity Library, um, to uh, create kind of an online resource for what needs to be done when and by whom. It has about 267 different activities. Um, and you can look at it by, by the category, by phase. There's kind of write up textbook write-ups for each of the activities and then um, case studies uh, that link to the activities themselves. Um, we had been for about five or six years tracking the flow of funding in the health security space, uh, in part because nobody else was doing it. And, and countries, donors were tripping over each other a little bit. Um, there was say a, a lot of money that was going to building laboratory capacity in Kenya, but nothing was going to risk communication in the Americas. So we, we had created this tool um, where we had been trying to, to capture the data um, in, 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 in financing. And then, um, you know, we're just at the point of starting to, to run some analyses and publish on it. So this is a, a clip from, um, something the team did, uh, and published in the World Economic Forum. Um, we, we had been working with, with CDC for, for a number of years on helping governments around the world set up their public health emergency operations center and then and launched in June uh, a new online tool that captures a lot of the CDC training material for this. Um, we had been asked by New York City to, you know, if, if they, they, New York City Department of Health came to us and said, you know, we're trying to figure out what, what um, data jurisdictions are tracking for contact tracing and, and we can't find it. So we put a whole bunch of students on it. They now have a, a, a Google sheet it's not very fancy, but they update it every two weeks, um, tracking uh, the contact tracing data in, in more than 60 jurisdictions. And they've now done some international comparative work on that as well. Um, we supported um, other faculty, uh, Jesse Goodman, who's the chief uh, science advisor for, for the FDA for years, um, is at Georgetown now and, and wanted to be able to put together a website to with, with colleagues to provide independent um, explanations, I guess, on what was happening with the FDA during during the, the fall. So we set up this site for him. Um, and because we're academics, we write, we write a lot. Um, everything, we, we, one of our faculty wrote a children's book on coronavirus. We, our, our students um, put together a series of, of infographics for how to protest safely um, in June. And this got picked up by Black Lives Matter. And then, um, 
myself and, and one of my colleagues, and uh, Alex Phelan, um, wrote the governance paper for the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. So, so we've been doing a lot of, we've been making a lot of words. Um, and just like many of you, um, uh, public health professionals have been kind of thrown into the spotlight because we've had to explain public health to the public. So we've we've done an extraordinary amount of, of, of press uh, since January of last year. Um, we've been able, fortunate to form a whole bunch of partnerships. Um, we've also, again, like many of us in the public health community, um, in the absence of coordinated federal response for for all of 2020, um, many of us had to were asked to do a lot of direct advising. So um, so our center has been involved in, in a lot of that. Um, we've we're now working. We we put together something called ILIAD, um, International Law Impact and Infectious Disease Consortium. So trying to bring together people from around the world working on these issues of of law and governance. Um, we curate the World Economic Forum page on COVID. Um, and, and now we're trying to figure out the, the what comes next piece. So we have a team that's doing a lot of work on predictive modeling and trying to pair ecology with health security. Um, some of this is done through the Verena um, Consortium, which is trying to look at big data and again, for predicting viruses. Um, we continue to do work on the international health regulations and viral sovereignty and again a lot of these global governance questions um we have a, a book forthcoming uh this spring called inoculating cities so a series of case studies in urban pandemic preparedness we have a team that's working on on issues of conflict and disease um and um we continue to try to build out this health security tracking again so we can we can have the empirical we can build that evidence base that people can use uh, for their analyses. Um, we, we do a lot of work in the deliberate biological space and, and trying to pair some of these efforts together. So one of the projects we're working on is actually writing draft um, material transfer agreements that could be used for um, UN teams doing investigations into alleged uh, biological weapons events. Um, yeah, I've been really fortunate to be part of this uh, effort that just launched on global.health, which is a data science initiative and um, epi, epi line data from around the world. Um, and one of the things that we've been working on is trying to make sure that all the data that we provide is publicly accessible and it's linked. So we are trying to build this, this idea of an integrated data architecture um, for data sources and tools and health security. And, and this was just launched um, we're calling it IDEA for International Disease and Event Analysis, uh, ghsidea.org, and, and invite, invite folks to, to play around with it if they're interested. Um, and uh, there is a team that is working on the next Global Health Security Conference that will now be in June of 2022. Um, and um, I, I expect we may have a, a larger community of practice than we did before. Um, and then finally, um, Taking, taking the, the language that was released, if you haven't read all 200 pages of it, in the National Strategy for the COVID-19 Response and Pandemic Preparedness, by the, it was released by the, by the Biden Administration White House, and, and specifically for, for me, looking at um, the National Security uh, Directive, it's now called Memorandum, um, on International COVID-19 Response, and, and thinking about how we map our work to, to this framework. And, um, and with that, let me let me stop talking because I've talked too much. Um, but but really interested in in hearing your questions or concerns or, or thoughts. Um, so, just thank you, thank you for for the for your time and interest and in, in letting me talk today. So let me let me stop sharing. Thank you, Professor Katz. We're going to turn over the conversation to uh, you and Albert Coe, uh, just alerting Albert to a couple of Q&A uh, 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 qu queries that have come in from the audience already. So fire away. OK. Well, first of all, thank you very much, um, Rebecca, for, for your presentation. It's, it's really quite humbling for us you know, to see the work that you've done over the last you know, decade or more and uh, in, in how that should have been, you know, how prescient it was, but also how really kind of, um, you know, enunciate some of the pitfalls that we went through, you know, during this COVID. So thank you very much. And then, and I, I can I can say we can, I can speak for all the students and 
from the faculty that, you know, how not only how appreciative we are about the work you're doing in the service to the government, but also how proud, you know, especially since you've come, you have you have uh, special ties, including to our Department of Epidemiology and Microbial Diseases. So thank you very much. So there are a lot of questions, and let me get to some of them. Um, and, and I'm trying to multitask. I have three different lines of questions coming at me. So, so I'll, I'll try to do justice to this. So I think one of the first questions that came up was that one, um, and I'll, I'll say this verbatim. So one of the biggest factors that impeded the COVID pandemic response in the US was social denial in conjunction to with uh, digital misinformation. Going forward, will future pandemic planning strategies incorporate methods to combat both digital misinformation and prevent social denial? It's a very nice question. Yeah. It's a fantastic question. And um, I, I mean, yes, I hope so. Um, I, I, I think one of the, well, um, there aren't too many great things about this past year, but one of the really um, exciting things of the past year has been that, um, well, e every smart person in the world has been singly focused on, on the pandemic, which means that we've, we've had the, we've, we've all, we've all benefited from the expertise of lots of different disciplines coming, coming to the, to, coming to play in, in our collective field, right? So I have, I have learned so much about misinformation and disinformation campaigns and, um, and, and from the, the teams that have applied the same thinking that they did for ISIL to misinformation campaigns for, for the pandemic. Um, so I think that there is, there's a really um, important space for, for people with, with health communication, health information, public health background to team with these um, information and communications experts from other fields, because it is, um, we see this, we see this all over the world and we, and the impact varies in different parts of the world by how, how much um, disinformation, misinformation is impacting the response. So I, I, it's not, it's not my expertise and, but I'm really excited to see the work that is starting to come out of this. No, very good, and and I know this has been on many of people's minds over the last year, and we've seen how it's played out. I'm not sure we've got it right, but we have the guardrails placed on it. And uh, so, so there are two questions that are kind of um, similar. So let me put the, try to see if I'm doing justice by putting them together. One is that, do you think in the future this pandemic will put more value on um, on and more resources into pandemic preparedness? and other forms of public health um, and emergency preparedness. So let me, that's one part. There's another question that came in, it's kind of um, uh, related, which is um, what I'd like to know is what your experience and observation, um, is there a deficiency in the design of strategies of, uh, of its um, pandemic preparedness implementation and approach? And how do we address this link of political instability and public backlash to you know, uh, benefit strategies? So, and let me tack on, so this gets to, I think what you had set us up with your presentation, where we came from and where we're gonna be going and you know, how do we get over this trap? Tra and I'll just add the anecdote, um, you know, on the local many fronts, you know, the public health officials just said that they threw out the play playbook on pandemic flu. It was just literally thrown out. They didn't, they didn't many places didn't even open. Um, so maybe, Putting all those things together about, um, you know, are we, are we, you know, what was the deficiency going back, and then, you know, what are we, are we really going to get it right the next time around? Um, all right, I'm trying to figure out what to take first. Um, who knows? I listen. I think on the on strategy and playbooks. We actually had some really strong playbooks that have been written out and exercised. Um, and, and I mentioned, you know, we all knew where the fault lines would be that didn't mean we hadn't thought about them. And I think that um, it, 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 it's, it's been an incredibly 
challenging year to see so much work literally just jettison. Um, do we need better strategy? Sure. I mean, I'm going back to the, I'm, I'm going back to, to the, you know, the fail, I don't know if it's failure or imagination, but failure to ask enough. Um, these are multidisciplinary problems. These are multi, you know, this is, this is not, these are not issues that can be handled just by a ministry of health or a local department of health. Um, we never really had the engagement of other sectors. We had kind of the engagement of some sectors maybe, but not wholeheartedly. Um, and so is there an opportunity to go back and re-strategize and to rethink about things and to look at new triggers? I, I think so. And I think that gets back to, to the, the, the question I didn't answer that your first question about kind of the social, um, the social actions. And I think um, it, we all know, any of us who work in any type of emerging infectious disease, that at the beginning of an outbreak, you are always acting under imperfect information. That we just don't, we're learning more every day, right? And, um, and so talking to a political leader and saying, I need you to take X action that's going to have a whole bunch of primarily fin financial consequences, maybe political consequences, and we may be right, but we're not sure, is a very hard conversation to have. It's a harder conversation to have with the general public that saying like, wait, you want me to do what? Why? And particularly with a public that hasn't had experience with an infectious disease or a similar type of event in the past. Now we did see, and I, I'm sure some of you on this, on this call have studied it in much more depth than I have, but um, I mean, let's, let's look at South Korea. MERS 2015 didn't, didn't go great. And what, 17,000 people were under quarantine. Um, they, but after that, they, they changed their laws, they changed their punishment, the, the population was ready. So when the, I think it was 2018 with the next MERS outbreak, it was contained to just a handful of cases and the public was willing to act quickly. And I think you saw this in a lot of um, Southeast Asian societies that, hey, there's a, there's, a, there's a novel coronavirus, everybody's masked. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, the, the social contract with your, with your community is that if you're not masked, it's, it was weird. It was, you know, you weren't, you weren't doing your part as part of the community. Now, Americans were not there at all. Um, would they be there next time round? I, I think that, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I think we would be in a very different position, right? We would have some muscle memory that we could, that we could flex. Um, and, and honestly, we're seeing that muscle memory right now with, with Ebola. Like we can all go back and talk about how long it took for the international community to jump in and, and work with, um, with West African nations on the response to Ebola in 2014. We can count the months between, you know, the eight months between when the first case emerged and when WHO declared a public health emergency of international concern. Um, there's, a, there are out, there's an outbreak right now in the forest region of Guinea and in the DRC. And um, the, the, I'm watching it now with the former members of the Obama administration who are now part of the Biden administration and their, their muscle memory is there. They are there, they are acting, they are, they are extraordinarily aggressive in the response. They are, you know, they're reaching out at all levels of government and they're, they're coordinating with WHO and they're shipping vaccine and, and the, the FATP graduates from across the continent are all, uh, everybody knows what to do. Um, we've been there. We've actually, we've, we've actually, we have an exercise that we've lived it and we now know what to do. And so, you know, we, we're not bad at fighting the last war. We know how to fight the last war. Now, do we know how to fight the next war? I don't know. And that gets back to that other question about strategy and, and how broad are we thinking in our strategy and how, how, what, what, what do, what, what does imagination look like now? 
Um, but I, I have to say, I, you know, we, we spent, there, there, was, there was dialogue for years about trying to engage ministries of finance in the, in the pandemic preparedness space and they just weren't at all interested or willing. Um, and so I think, you know, and part of it was because they were like, listen, why would I ever invest in this thing that's existential that may or may not happen when I've got, you know, kids dying from malaria under the age of five in my country and that's a real threat right in front of me. Um, so I think, I think that the dialogue shifts once you've experienced something. So, so you know, the, um, Rebecca, you 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 raised a lot just in the answer for the last question. You raised a lot of important points, and the one this issue of muscle memory and the cognitive processes that are used by, you know, uh, in governance for decision making, and and also kind of I like that that um, the analogy with we know how to fight the last war, but how do we know how to fight the um, the next war? I, I'm I'm still of the generation that remembers the Vietnam War and how that was that played out very badly for the you know, United States. But I wanna pick up on two things that you said there uh, and trying to get to the structural. So, so certainly I think, you know, I think if you, you in your discussion just you know, nailed it in terms of what we didn't know about the, those cognitive processes and, and uh, the way we're thinking about it. But I just wanna go through some structural issues that you, so you, you emphasize the issue that these responses have to be multidisciplinary, and and, and obviously, and that resonates very much with um, you know with our school of public health. Um, and and one, you also mentioned about the IOM IOM report, which really, which I thought was you know this, I think it was I'm not sure if it was the 2003 or the 1997 one, but it had that convergence model, where you didn't only have the microbe and the human, but you had the you know, the, the uh, environment, you had the social factors, you had the political and economic factors in a convergence model. Um, I would say that we didn't really, you know, it, there's been a lot of discourse on that, but there's not been a lot of action on that part. And, uh, and I know you've been probably leading the fight against that in action, but it's really, when you think about it structurally, it's, the, it's that model versus the biomedical model. And my gut feeling is the biomedical model is still winning, winning out, and it's winning out in, in um, you know, with COVID. What, what do you, what, how, how can it change that? You know, and it's, it's. I, I think we've seen the, the, the defects or the harms that have been caused by that biomedical model. What, what are your thoughts on how, how to, um, you know, going moving forward? You know, I don't have a great answer for you. I don't. I mean, I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a. It's a it's a fascinating question. It's an important question. And I think that. Um, I'm sorry, you're on the same council. You're the same task force as Tony Fauci. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, I'm sure he has a, a much more eloquent answer on this. I mean, I think what's. No, no, I, I apologize for putting you on the spot on that one. But yeah. I, I think it's, I, I think what's really, what's, what's been really interesting to me in the, um, I mean, let's just take One Health for a second. Let's just take the, the I, I, can't, I can't take on the entire convergence model, but let me, let's just take on animal health and human health. Um, the US government uh, in, in, through the global health security agenda, through some of the programming from USAID, from CDC, um, sang the song of, of One Health and worked with and, and, and probably spent a, a lot of money on, on implementation and trying to implement this One Health model in other countries and in countries that, that hadn't, hadn't fully kind of developed their, their system yet. Um, Tanzania. I mean, there, there were places where, you know, there, it, 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 it's, it's Tanzania is not a great example for some other reasons, but like there was, there's been a lot of effort to kind of think and build these models in other places where we have not had any success or even interest in doing so domestically. And, um, and I, I, I don't know the answer. I don't know how we get there. Um, well, good. And, and so let me do this. There are several other great questions that are coming up. So 
So uh, that, that's, um, and I apologize. Can you let me park that on the side and-, and Yeah, I apologize, apologize for putting a spot on that one, but there's one from uh, Kavi Kushin, one of our, our colleagues at Epidemiology Microbial Disease, who I, I'm sure you know very well. And his is that, what are the thoughts on how we can strengthen infectious disease surveillance in conflict affected uh, settings, yeah. Syria, yeah. Yemen, where just the major cholera outbreaks and so forth. Uh, yeah, well, I, I put the question back to him since this is his, his area of work and, and, and we all and we all watch it carefully. I, I don't know. I think there's um, it, this is a this is a I don't want to say a, a weak spot in the chain like it's because it's there's so many complicating factors. I don't want to simplify it. I think that um, there is we are in places where systems are so broken for so many reasons. Um, how, do we, how do we do surveillance? Um, I'm also worried about how we actually do health care with, with populations that are suffering so much. Um, we, we've done a little bit of monkeying around and thinking about um, governance. So in a, in a refugee camp, for example, who's responsible for implementing the international health regulations? Who's responsible for this public health surveillance piece and for reporting and response? And I'm not sure UNHCR has ever come forward and says, yes, that's us. Um, I, to me, it's always been a bit of a gray area um, that, that we really need to, to further explore. We actually have a team that's, 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 um, that's trying to work through some of these issues now and, and particularly working in, um, in, in Northern Jordan and, and the refugee camps there and looking at this. But I, I think it's it's slightly easier to get my head around. I, I hate to say that, slightly easier to get my head around in a camp as it is in a in a um, in kind of an ungoverned space or in a in a really non-permissive environment. So Rebecca, I've been looking at the wrong chat box and now I see there's a lot of questions. That oh no. Okay. Up. So let, let me go through one. So there's one great one about What's your perspective on the importance of simulation gaming moving forward and improving our um, ability to respond to future uh, pandemics? Yeah, we're rich history and taking part in simulations. What are your insights would be terrific. Um, I think they are not something we should do right now while we're in the middle of a response. Um, I think it's the last thing you want to do is pull people away from from their day jobs when when you're trying to in, in the process of saving lives. But over, you know, they've they've always been critical. They've always been critical for 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 moving moving thinking forward, for moving policy forward, and for and for identifying where all the gaps are. Um, you know, the military has always done this. We 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 exercise. Um, and so thinking about how to exercise at, from the local level to the international level, I think is critical. Okay, good, good. And I'm gonna go a little bit more rapidly on the okay. other ones, but I'm ready. a little bit more Maybe. focused, but, but this one's a, actually an important one. And um, you know, this is from somebody who's worked on pandemic planning um, on behalf of um, HHS in the mid 2000s. Um, he's asking um, specifically how resource limited countries, particularly those in, in Africa, will be supported in receiving sufficient COVID vaccines. Um, so a little bit different tax on, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as well as the, the kind of means to, to implement these uh, vaccine vaccination distributions. Yeah, so um, I, uh, well, I could, I could switch hats slightly and give you the, um, so the, the Biden administration answer on that, which is um, the, the, the Biden administration has made a commitment to working multilaterally um, for equitable distribution of vaccine. So um, if, if folks saw last week, there was a commitment of $2 billion, $2 billion to support COVAX um, with a commitment of $2 billion more to come. Um, the majority of that is designed to go to procurement um, but also with a, a piece of it to put aside to, to think about the structures that are required for vaccination. And so the, the how to, you know, from cold chain to workforce to data management um, to, to the, the, the other supplies that are required. Um, but that's, as you all know, COVAX does, is, is designed to eventually get to 20% of the global population 
or the, at least the population of the countries that are designated for COVAX. Um, but th that's not the end of the ambition, right? Like, can we think about can we think about using the U.S. contribution to leverage other countries and other donors to supporting this this route? Um, can we can we get to a point? I, and and for the disease modelers on this call, what's the tipping point? We, I don't think we have a really clear answer on what the tipping point is for where we go from epidemic to endemic. Is it, is it, and, and I assume we'll go to endemic. I don't think this, we're not gonna be, we're not gonna end, we're not gonna, we're not gonna eliminate this virus. Um, so is it, you know, what, what should the global ambition be? Should we be looking at 60% vaccination coverage around the world? Clearly we, we you know, this is, this is assuming that we've done all healthcare workers, all hours populations. You know, what again where where is that tipping point and and then how do we how do we pivot um quickly with emerging variants and um and i think you saw saw uh, i think moderna is already moving forward on a booster shot and pfizer as well for addressing variants so i think but but back to your question on like will you know is that is that low resource environments um i think it's a global commitment and we've all have to come together to figure out how we how we ensure that the world gets vaccinated. Great. Okay, so I'm going to round back. There's this. There's actually a question from uh, Adam Moore, who's one of our alumni, who's now in a PhD program, and he's asking about. You know, I agree that One Health is critically important paradigm to follow, but researching human animal environmental factors that influence disease, and one um, and one that is complicated and time consuming. You know, is, is fraught with problems, and how can you know, how can you actually incorporate that, particularly in the publish and perish attitude of academia? Um, uh, make, you can't um, ask you to ask, answer all the structural problems of academia in one question. I mean, I think, <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. It is critically Rebecca, important. We're, we're, we're waiting for the answer. <laughs> right, it, it, no, it's critically important. And we do it in academia because we have the space and the time to, and hopefully the funding to. All right, good, good. Now I'm going to take there's, there's a line in the chat, and I apologize because now I'm seeing. Um, I was looking at a different, you know, part of the Zoom for the questions, but now there's a kind of a line of thought, and that kind of follows it up. Um, you know, putting some questions. There's a lot of smart people out there, a lot of smart people working on COVID. How come we didn't get it right? And uh, and kind of correlated, you know, and how could we have kind of missed? Completely missed out on things like the vaccine rollout, um, uh, and, and so forth. Um, is there a structural policy issue behind that? Behind that, that really a lot of smart people, but we just couldn't get it together. I think um, so. You know, I've been, I've been, I've been working on these issues for about twenty years. They have never been partisan. They've always been political. They've never been partisan. Um, and I, I say this saying, you know, my 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 first boss at at the Department of State was John Bolton. I mean, they really have never been. They have never been partisan. They became partisan. And I think you have had a lot of smart people and a lot of people who had done a lot of planning and thinking. Who who didn't have who didn't have the space to operate the way they would have, and so I think um, I, I I think unfortunately a lot of the the failures of response were based off of of, of partisan action. Um, there continue to be a lot of really smart people who are working day and night. Many of you on this call are, are some of them who haven't slept in a year. Um, I, 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 I'd like to declare, by the way, that like maybe 20, late 2022 or 2023 is like public health community vacation month. Um, so we, we all get to go sit on a beach somewhere. Um, but, but I think there, there continue to be people who, who, who know what to do, who, who, who know what actions to take, who are who are waiting to do that, and hopefully now have the latitude to be able to take to 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 flex their to flex their muscles and to do what they they think is right. So so that leads. There was a color question uh, about um, you know exactly that issue about um, that you know we had 
the was um, in the chat box said we had to combat our own leadership. Uh, what advice do you have if we if this should happen again? Oh, I don't have any good advice. I mean, I think except that you know, do we yell louder? I don't know. I mean, there it is. It is. Um, yeah, I was I was telling Don Carroll before we we got on this um, before before the Zoom started that it's been a really surreal year for many of us in the public health community, right? So those of us who who are on social media went from having you know a very small number of niche followers who were interested in the last publication we read to you know to to many thousands of people who in little like check marks next to our name now. Um, I think the public health community has has a, a platform that it's never had before. Um, it, it's not always good. Like people have been attacked. Um, people, so many, so many in our community have quit. Um, it's been it's been a, it's been a hard year, but it's also I think um, kind of a, we also have a responsibility to use our voices. Okay, very good. And let's see. So, the um, uh, I, I've pretty I've covered much of the qu questions. I just want to open it up to Sten. Sten, is there any questions that you know you'd like to, or, or you know, comments and questions that you'd like to uh, say in the last last few minutes to in discourse? Well, I, I want to thank you, Albert, for spearheading the Q and A, and especially thank. Rebecca for coming back to her alma mater uh, for this, uh, this Dean's lecture. Uh, you had an excellent uh, turnout. Uh, I recognize names from all over the country and, and, and several from all over the world. Uh, a good chunk of folks from um, um, our broader Yale community. Sometimes these dean le Dean's lectures pull in just from the school mostly, and this one was truly uh, an extraordinary reach. We wish you every success um, in your consultative role with the uh, State Department and the White House uh, Task Force on COVID. We're very proud of your role and we would like to make the offer that anything that we can do from the Yale School of Public Health, Yale School of Medicine, School of Nursing, to be of use to you at any time, please let us know. And uh, on that note, we really are, um, uh, uh, thank you most sincerely for your work, for your leadership over these many years. It's a, it's a bittersweet time, I think, where we um, recognize that new leadership in various positions in Washington is likely to take this much more seriously than uh, perhaps old leadership did, um, but also that we uh, got it so wrong. Uh, uh, that that two years ago, three years ago, we could have done so much more. Uh, a year ago, we could have done so much more. Six months ago, we could have done so much more. And uh, that leaves it uh, a bittersweet moment that the US has invited uh, the worst COVID pandemic of any country in the world. Having said that, we can probably do so much better. We know we can. And uh, with leaders such as yourself, we're really excited to see what can be possible in the upcoming years for true global pandemic preparedness. We give you the final word. Oh, um, I, I don't know how to, how to follow that, I, except to say thank you. And, and um, thank you for the opportunity to be with you, all of you today. Um, I'm, I'm truly I'm honored. I'm also humbled by the, by the charge, um, but also again, to thank the, the Yale community. Um, there, there's so many people from this community who have who have stepped up, who have who have who have been helping at from the community level to the international level and sharing their wisdom and, and guidance and and so appreciative and um, just very thankful to be to be associated with this group. All right, marvelous. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you.